hymns we sing together, come now found. So I hope that you will prayerfully consider your gift, your generous gift, your sacrificial gift to the Lighting Room Christmas Offering, an opportunity to give funds directly to um, those areas where the gospel is not yet heard. Uh, we will have an opportunity as a church to celebrate uh, a meal together, celebrate the season, celebrate missions on December 11th. So I hope that you'll make plans on that day to join us for our Christmas celebration, an international lunch, uh, that we need your help in providing dishes from around the world. Uh, if you need help with that, Tammy has put together a resource that is 24 pages long uh, of information about uh, countries, uh, what, the, what they're interested in there, what they eat there, and, and you can get that resource from us and say, you know, I want to make something from Poland. I'm not sure what they eat in Poland, but you can find out. Tammy's done the research. 
and bring that to share, a dish to share on the 11th, right after the service, we'll also be having a cookie auction. Uh, cookies were a big part of Lottie Moon's ministry. She, they were little tea cakes, uh, actually. And uh, so we wanted you to bring your favorite Christmas cookie or try out a Christmas cookie on us and maybe it will become your favorite. Um, but your family each has an opportunity to enter five plates of cookies. You don't have to do that. If you just want to bring one dozen cookies, that's great. But if you want to bring up to five dozen different varieties of cookies, we're going to do a silent auction like we've done in the past during the Valentine's Day season. And we're going to give all of that money uh, to fund missionaries like you just saw there in Poland and around the world. So I hope you'll join us. I hope that this will be a season of excitement for what God's doing around the world. And we get to not only taste it, uh, some mm -hmm. foods from around the world, but get to fellowship together and, and generously give to the work that's happening around the world. Uh, Ken and Marisa, it's great to see y'all here today. Y'all are not ministering necessarily around the world, but around our country. Uh, we're grateful to see you for the work that God's doing uh, through your RV. Uh, not through your RV, but through your words. Uh, <laughs> uh, that, that, that the RV provides you to give the words uh, to say to those that you're camping around and with. We're grateful to see you. It's always an encouragement to hear what God's doing around our country uh, through missionaries like yourself. So um, great to see you all here today. Uh, let us pray together as we uh, dig into the word. Father, I am thankful for your work that's going on around the world. And I'm thankful for your work that's going on in families right in this room. God, for the hard conversations that happened around the Thanksgiving table this season, we give you thanks. God, for the changes in schedule that happened over this Thanksgiving season, it caused to remind us that you're in charge, not us. Pray for those who are struggling, Father. Respiratory illnesses, burns. I pray for Julie today, God, that you continue to bring healing to her body. Thank you for the miraculous way in which you've got her right where she needed to be at just the right time to receive a procedure that um, is done with excellence there at the Burn Center. Thank you for her time at home now. I pray that it would be a time of reflecting on your goodness to her, even when it looked different than she might have imagined. Thank you for your work in our lives. And as we open this text today, I ask that you would help us to see the freedom that's offered to us because of Christ. We have been set free. Would you then take the truths that we receive today and cause them to be implanted deep in our hearts that it might change the way we look at the world, it might change the way we engage the world with the hope of Christ, that it might change us so that we would be passionate about taking this message of Jesus Christ to the world. I thank you for our international missionaries. I thank you for our North American missionaries. And I thank you for our friends, Ken and Marisa, who are boldly taking the good news into dark places. We do pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. Have you ever taken that morning walk out to your mailbox or maybe out to your garden or maybe just to get in your car to go to work and found yourself immersed in a spider web? Does that ever happen to you? I mean, immediately that sticky web takes hold of our face and we tirelessly work to get the goo off of us before the spider starts crawling up our neck. And it seems like we rid one part of our face from the web, only to have it cling to another place. And when we finally think that we've gotten it all off, we keep scratching ourselves the rest of the day, thinking that there are some remains still on us. Well, sin is a lot like that spider web. It envelops us and clings to us. And no matter how hard we, we wrestle with sin, on our own, we can't do anything about it. We're in bondage to it. 
Paul writes about the frustration with wanting to do good only to end up doing the very thing he didn't want to do. It's a struggle that we face in the flesh. And so the first seven chapters of Paul's letter to the Romans details our grim situation. God is holy. He's given us the law to know him, but we can't meet the demands of the law, leaving us stuck in a web of despair and doubt and frustration. But everything changes when we cross over to Romans chapter 8. It's like that liberating feeling that you, when you know for certain that the spider web isn't on you anymore. It's that feeling that you get when you've been in hours long traffic on I-77 trying to get home from Thanksgiving and all of a sudden the road opens up in front of you and it's like, ah, finally. Ken and Marisa can speak to that, I'm sure, about traffic all around the country. It's like that beautiful view of the valley below and the mountain peaks off in the distance when reaching the summit after you spent a long day trudging up a mountain. Romans 8 declares to us freedom. That's what it says all over the pages of the text. So if you have your copy of God's Word, most of you already opened there when you saw it on the screen. I'm grateful for that. But if you haven't already, turn with me, please, to Romans chapter 8. Because I want you to see about this freedom that Paul's writing to us about. So if you think first seven chapters, think law. Law is good, but I'm wrestling with this in my flesh. I can't get out of it. It's entangling me. And then you get to Romans chapter 8, verse 1. It says this. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That verse changes everything. The term condemnation carries the idea of penal servitude. Imagine having done your time in prison only to be set free where you spend the rest of your life trying to work real hard to earn your release from prison. That's crazy. Why would anyone keep on working to free themselves from something they've been set free from? And so as believers, we don't need to live as though we should go on doing penal servitude as if we haven't been set free from the prison house of sin. The, the, the Bible says we're now in Christ. It's Paul's way of saying that all the benefits of salvation flow to us by virtue of our being united to the Savior, all made possible by the liberating work of the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 8 is all about the freedom the Holy Spirit brings to believers. So as we walk through this text with great theological depth, I want us to take special notice of the ways in which the Spirit sets us free. And so the opening explosion of liberating joy is that we're free from judgment. So let's pick up in verse 2. We're free from judgment. Think about that as we read these, these verses. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own son, the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, remember he's writing to believers in Rome. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, 
He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. There is freedom from judgment. Paul details our freedom from that judgment using the two concepts of laws or principles. He says there's the law of the spirit of life. That's one of those laws or principles. And then there's the law of sin and death, another one of those principles. Now, the law of sin and death shows us who we are in light of God's perfect expectations for his people. Well, what's the verdict? The verdict is we're sinners. The, the verdict is in our sin, there's a war raging inside between a desire to do right, but having a body that's still captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. It's not that God's law was bad. It was perfect. But it was powerless to enable us to live up to its perfect standard because of the weakness of our flesh. So God did what the law could not do. He sent his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. That word likeness is crucial because if Paul had said Christ came in sinful flesh, it would imply that sin was in him. If Paul had said Christ came in the likeness of flesh, it would imply Christ only seemed to be in the flesh without any hint of deity. But Paul said, in the likeness of sinful flesh, to make clear that Christ took on man's flesh without becoming a sinner. So in the likeness of sinful flesh, Christ conquered sin. In Christ, we're now justified before the Father, free from judgment. You see, justification is a legal or judicial declaration by God that we're righteous in his sight, not because of our works, but because he imputes or credits the righteousness of his son as our own. So when Satan tries to get inside our head and lie to us about our past and make us think that God is sitting on his throne, delighted to condemn us, delighted to see us punished, we can rejoice in the freedom offered to us by the Spirit and know that we can't be condemned if we are in Christ because Christ has already suffered that condemnation for us on the cross. Where sin once condemned us, Christ now condemns sin, delivering us from sin's penalty and power. That's real freedom, church. We no longer have to sin. The Spirit offers us a new humanity, a new humanity that's in union with Christ, giving us the power to live in a way that's pleasing to God. So the Holy Spirit liberates us through Christ, where all of Christ's perfections are communicated to us, giving us the ability to do the law of God from our heart, not out of duty, but out of delight. Mm -hmm. With the help of the Holy Spirit in this freedom from judgment, we are to live contrary to the flesh. We have the freedom to do that, though. Apart from the work of Christ in us, we can't. We keep just wrestling inside and it doesn't get us anywhere. But in God's eyes, there are only two kinds of people in the world. Those who do not belong to him and those who do. Paul describes it as people who live according to the flesh in contrast with those who live according to the spirit. If we live according to the flesh, our minds are set on the things of the flesh. Our minds are dead. They're hostile to God. In the flesh, there's no submission to God's law because the flesh can't submit and therefore cannot please God. Philippians 3.19 speaks of those who live according to the flesh like this. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. Earthly things like false philosophies and religions that appeal to the self and their attraction to the flesh. See, in the flesh, it's all about us. Paul speaks of the works of the flesh in Galatians 5, calling out such things as sexual immorality, impurity, jealousy, fits of rage, and things like that. Being that we're at the end of Thanksgiving weekend, I didn't want us to miss that one of the primary signs 
of fleshly living is ingratitude. If you think back to Genesis chapter 3, Eve was tempted to not be thankful for all the abundant trees in the garden that she could eat from. But instead, she harbored an ungrateful heart toward God from the one tree she was told to stay away from. Paul goes so far as to base sin in a lack of thanksgiving that ultimately moves to idolatry. Romans chapter 1, we talked about it in our equip group today. Romans chapter 1, verse 20 through 22 says, For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God, listen to this, or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Now watch how ungratefulness moves to idolatry. Look what he says. Claiming to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man. Here, here's the idolatry. Images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. So an unthankful heart cannot be a Godward heart which is exactly the great problem with those whose minds are set on the flesh. But the Holy Spirit liberates us to a mind that offers life and peace, which is no longer obligated to the flesh. We give thanks in order to honor God as God. To know Him is to know thankfulness. The Holy Spirit offers victory over the old nature of ingratitude, which raised us up to honor self above all, and now empowers us to live in the new nature, seeking to honor God above all with thanksgiving. New nature that displays the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those whose minds are set on the Spirit experience something of the disposition of Jesus because we are in Christ. So His kindness, His gentleness, His love are all displayed in our lives. That is a life that's set on the things of the Spirit. This life in Christ offers us a new identity then as sons and daughters of God. Let's pick up in verse 12. So then, brothers... We are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who were led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, look at this, provided we suffer with him in order that we may be also glorified in him. The idea of adoption is not a foreign concept to us. It's where the believer who was once a stranger to God enters God's family, becomes a child of God. Adoption, as one theologian puts it, is that saving blessing wherein believers, by virtue of their communion with the true Son of God, share in His Sonship by grace, are given the right to be called and received as beloved children of the Father, and inherit the immeasurable rights and privileges secured by the only begotten Son, Jesus. By adoption, the redeemed sons and daughters of the Lord God Almighty. We get to become that, and we're introduced into and given the privileges of God's family. Some of those privileges include the fact that He loves us. He understands us. He provides for us by giving us good gifts. He leads us. He disciplines us. He makes us family, even to the intimacy of getting to call Him Daddy. No one dreamed of calling God the Father, Daddy, or even Father, until Christ modeled it for us. And so now that we are in Christ, 
and adopted into the family of God, we're given permission to call him daddy. Finally, one of those benefits of adoption is he makes us an heir. All things are ours in Christ. We are rightful heirs of it all. Just let that sink in for a moment. We are heirs of it all in Christ. Well, just like on earth, if, if you're an heir of an estate, you have a responsibility. For us as believers, as heirs, we have a responsibility. We have a joy to go and tell the world what our daddy has done for us and what he offers to those who are still captivated by sin. Being heirs also means we have a stewardship responsibility of the resources God has given us. Resources of time, resources of talent, and yes, resources regarding our finances. Being heirs also means, and that's, that's where we're going to get to, and, and he elaborates on this, being heirs also means sharing in the sufferings of Christ. But the Spirit offers us freedom, here comes our next freedom, this freedom to know hope in the midst of suffering. Look at verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory of that is to be revealed to us. Look back at 17. I want us to hear, put them together. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. For I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. Creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in the hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. Think of earthquakes, think of hurricanes. The whole earth is groaning. Verse 23, and not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Let's face it, we're going to experience suffering in this life. Most of us in this room could stand up and give testimony if I asked you to right now to speak about the suffering that you've experienced. So it is natural, it's normal. Those apart from Christ can't hope for their future when they suffer because it doesn't come upon them for Christ's sake and can't produce any spiritual blessing. People who are living for this life only can't look forward to the day when wrongs are right or the comfort of their souls. Their pain or loneliness or rejection serve no divine purpose and bring no divine reward. The believer, however, understands that this suffering is something that we get to share with Christ. It's purposeful and it's doing something in us. 2 Corinthians 4, 17 says, For this slight momentary affliction, look what it's doing, is preparing for us an eternal way to glory beyond all comparison. Health, wealth, prosperity preacher didn't tell you that. The Word said that. We can have great hope because the sufferings we are facing will eventually end and they will add to our eternal glory. Remember, God has two purposes in his plan, his glory and our good. And so when this life is hard, we can have hope for the future because our difficult days are purposeful. In a blend of poetry, Paul also describes how creation has been longing for redemption. Paul chose longing in this passage to express hope. The Greek word of longing is basically a standing on your tiptoes kind of gaze. 
It's an anticipation that something is getting ready to happen. Church, we're talking about plants and animals and mountains and rivers and plains and ocean and sky. They're all patiently waiting for the redemption of men because creation wants to be freed from decay and bondage as well. It says ever since the fall, creation has been subjected to futility without success and without really being able to achieve a purpose or goal. Just as man's sin brought corruption to the universe, man's redemption will restore the earth to its divinely intended beauty and glory. The pains of childbirth, ladies, many of you can understand this, the pains of childbirth will be felt no longer because creation will finally be delivered back to its place of indescribable delight. That pain, there's, there's hope in that. Okay, and Paul uses that to speak about this. Believers part ways with creation, though. And that while we groan and long and wait with hope, we've been given the first fruits of the Spirit. Believers have the Holy Spirit living inside them. The Son does not. So the Son is waiting in hope for the redemption of mankind, but it doesn't have the Spirit inside of it. We do. And so we have this Spirit whose work in us is a typical kind of first fruit. It's a foretaste of the glory that's awaiting us in our heavenly home when our ravaged and worn bodies will be replaced with immortal ones. It's amazing. The Spirit in us is a foretaste of glory divine. And it's evident there's the reality that the Spirit's actually in us is evident when we demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit that we've talked about. When we live like that in a world that's totally out of control apart from Christ, we're demonstrating that we have that foretaste, that we're living for a different world. And that sufferings are being used of God to bring Him glory and for our good. Until then, what do we do? We eagerly wait. That word longing, that standing on my tiptoes, I think I can see, kind of longing for that day. The hope for our future, church, is the completion of our sanctification. Yes, heaven's going to be amazing. When we see Christ and the fullness of our sanctification is done, that's the joy of heaven. I know seeing so-and-so is, is a big picture and a big part of funeral services and, and a grieving process. We're excited for those who've gone on to heaven and we talk about, I can't wait to see Grandma Moses and Grandma, you know, and all these things. I'm not using Moses the patriarch there. I, you know, Grandma Moses might be a real lady. But, but you hear that around death. We hear people talk about, I can't wait to see so-and-so. Heaven isn't about seeing so-and-so. Heaven is about seeing Christ where our sanctification will be complete. The hope for our future is in the completion of our sanctification. Paul states the obvious in verse 24. You don't hope for what you can already see. I hope a candle will show up right here. Well, that's silly. There's already a candle right here. I don't have to hope that a candle will show up right here. We don't do that. His point in this life, we can't expect to experience the fullness of our sanctification, our, in other words, our glorification, because we're still on earth. And while we're here, our sanctification won't be complete until we stand before Jesus face to face. And that's why Paul says at the end of 1 Corinthians 13 that faith, hope, and love remain, but the greatest of them is what? Love. Love. Why? Because in heaven you won't need faith and you won't need hope. Your faith will be sight. And you won't have to hope for the glorification because you'll already be that way. Faith and hope aren't necessary in heaven. So while we can't experience the fullness of our sanctification, yet we can hope for it. Since the believer's hope is based on the promises of God, guess what? We can be assured that the completion of our sanctification in a far greater way than the assurance that comes by seeing something with our eyes. This truth then gives us the assurance. We have amazing, an amazing future ahead of us. And since we know that, since we know that there's an amazing future ahead of us, we can wait for it with patience. Doesn't mean we don't long for it. 
Does it mean we don't say, come quickly, Lord Jesus? The end of the book ends that way, right? Come quickly. It doesn't mean that that's wrong. But we can wait for it patiently. It's truth. From Philippians 1, 6, I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work and you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ will bring it to completion. That's a promise for those who are in Christ. There is freedom to have hope, church. We're free to hope in suffering because while creation groans and we groan, even the Holy Spirit groans as a means of identifying the pain in the world and the church, sharing in the longing for final freedom of both. Look at verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we don't know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us, look, with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Our groaning is because of sin, but the Holy Spirit has no sin. So there's great comfort in knowing that the Spirit is so connected to us that he shares our grief. There are times in our lives where we're so hurt, so devastated that we felt like we all we could get out in prayer were a few words, but this offers us hope. Spirit intercedes for us. The groaning is too deep for words. There will come a day when we may be so close to life's end that we won't even know how to pray. But the Spirit intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. The Spirit isn't offering to coach us from the sidelines. No, He's rolling up His sleeves and He gets in the game to bear our weakness with us. This is real help because we often don't know how to pray. So the Spirit goes before the one who's in control of all things in the universe and He advocates for us. We have a helper that stands before the God of the universe. I have two senators that stand before Congress that attempt to represent me before the President of the United States. That's great. It's highly unlikely that a request that I made through my senators will get to the ears or desk of the President who would then give me a response back. Highly unlikely. This isn't a political conversation. It's just the, you know, who I am, who the President is. There's a great gap. Because of the Spirit, we can talk to the King of the Universe. And he's spoken to us. And I don't need a red line, a green line, or a blue line to talk to him. I have a spirit that's interceding on my behalf with groanings. He knows what I'm going through so well. He's going and groaning too. Our freedom to know hope and suffering is meant to lead us to a future glory. For as we share in Christ's sufferings, we'll share his glory. God's glory, defined, is the manifestation of his splendor. Our words and our minds cannot really comprehend the glory that awaits us. But one writer puts it like this. One day, we're going to be creatures so glorious that if we saw such ones today, we'd be tempted to fall down and worship them. You understand what that, that, that person's saying? One day, we're going to be so glorious that the, 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 the transformation that's happened to us is going to be so amazing that if we could see that future us now, we'd be tempted to fall down and worship that kind of creature. Until then, until that day, the Holy Spirit carries us from one level of glory to another because salvation brings continual growth in divine glory until it's perfected in the likeness of Christ himself. This hope this future glory is all grounded in the conformity to the image of Christ. And the Spirit offers us the freedom to have confidence that nothing is random in that sanctifying word. Look at verse 28 through 30. You're all ready for this one, right? You've seen it on your coffee cups probably before. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. 
in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Most of us have probably quoted verse 28 to someone walking through a difficult situation. But we must understand from the beginning that this verse does not mean everything will turn out okay in this life. It does not mean that. We cannot use it like that. What it does mean is that the culmination of all God's work in our lives are for the good which does our soul good. So we talk about the good, it isn't necessarily good things here on this planet, but that which does our soul good. Things like breaking us off from sin. Things like bringing us near to God. Things like weaning us from the world. Things like fitting us for heaven. Providence of God uses all things for our temporal and eternal benefit. Sometimes it's saving us from tragedy. Sometimes it's sending us straight into it. Both are meant to draw us closer to him. Think of the Israelites who wandered in the wilderness after being rescued from bondage in Egypt. God didn't do it for evil, but to accomplish his good that had to come through a difficult refining process. Sometimes in the middle of that refinement, we can forget those truths. But God reminds us that he's the author of our faith. And if he's the author, he gets to write our story. He sees our salvation through to the end. So our confidence rests in that all that God calls, he'll see through to glorification. From beginning to end, our salvation is all about God. And God's divine plan, the how, may be a mystery. I'll acknowledge that. The how is a mystery. But the goal of what sometimes folks have called this chain of redemption, the goal of that sequence from being predestined all the way to glorification, all of the, the goal of that is to be like Jesus. And we must not miss how that last word of verse 30 glorified is in the past tense. He said, what's the big deal about that? Our future glorification is so certain that Paul speaks of us as already glorified, but the unveiling of our complete glory awaits the coming of the Lord. But what do we do until then? Paul realizes that many fearful believers still have many doubts about their security. And he knows that false teachers will come in and try to exploit those doubts. And so those doubts are summed up by two closely related questions. Can any person or can any circumstance cause a believer to lose their salvation? What I want us to see here is According to these last verses, that we can know the freedom to live without fear. Look at verse 31. For what then shall we say to these things? I mean, he's summing it all up, right? I mean, with all of this that I've already just said, what can we say to him? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we're being killed all the day long. We're regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No! And all these things were more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm sure that neither death, nor light, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. We are free church to live without fear. God is for us in all that he does. We may be defeated at moments in our lives, but evil will not prevail as we are always being led to victory in Christ. Four ways I want us to see this victory. Really quickly. Sorry. 
I recognize what I'm for right here. How do we realize that victory? First, we see the victory in the battlefield. If God is for us and with God for us, while we will have opposition, our salvation is secure. No weapon of the enemy can undo or take away what God has done for us in our justification and ultimate glorification. So the battle is already won. There's victory in the battle. Yes, you'll be tempted as believers. But there's victory because we have the Spirit inside of us who can help us in that temptation. God's word promised a way out. Number 10. Number two, there's victory in our provision. God's willingness to give us everything, including his very son, is an assurance that we don't have to be afraid of his meeting our daily needs. We don't have to wonder, is he going to provide for that daily need? We don't have to wonder because there's victory in our provision. He who did not spare his own son. Third, there's victory in the courtroom. God's the judge. God's the judge. And if he has justified us, we can live with the freedom to not fear condemnation. If accusations are brought against us, Jesus' intercessory work silences the accuser. Because where's Jesus? He's at the right hand of God. And so if the accuser comes and says, oh, 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 what about when Chris did this? Tries to get God's attention. Jesus intercedes. Oh, whoa, oh, oh. whoa. He's mine. There's victory in the corporate the church. Fourth, there's victory in the marriage of Christ and his church. God will allow nothing to separate us from his love. Our confidence isn't in our love for him because that's often frail, fickle, and faltering. No, it's in his love for us, which is steadfast, faithful, and persevering. Church in Christ, we are more than conquerors. We're not just conquerors. We're more than conquerors. We're super conquerors. That's what we are now, and that's how we'll see ourselves through all eternity, not in our own strength, but in the grace that is in Christ. So because we are more than conquerors, we can say with David, when I am afraid, I will trust in you. Because we're more than conquerors, we can say with Moses, the eternal God is a dwelling place, and underneath are the everlasting arms. Because we're more than conquerors, we can say with the writer of Hebrews, this hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast. Church in Christ, we are free. We're free from judgment. We're free to live contrary to the flesh. We're free to hope in the midst of suffering. We're free to have confidence, and we're free not to fear. Because if God is for us, who can be against us? Father, thank you for these words today. These words of freedom that Paul so eloquently put down in writing for us to hear by your Spirit, having given them to him to help us understand the joy of our salvation. Father, I recognize, however, that gathering of this size, there may be those who have yet to surrender their will for your will. They continue to set their minds on the things of the flesh because that's better able to be controlled. They set their mind on false teachings, false prophecies, gathering around what their itching ears want to hear, and I pray today that today might be a day of salvation. They be set free from the lies of the enemy. <clears throat> For we know the truth. There's one way home, and that's through Jesus Christ. In Him we give all the sake and for his glory we pray. Amen. Church family, would you stand as we take an opportunity to consider this song sovereign over us. It's really declaring what we, the truths that we've heard. If God is for us, who can be against us? 
If he's truly sovereign over us, then we don't have to fear. We don't have to fear judgment. We don't have to keep our minds over here. We can set our minds on the things above. Use this time to worship him. He's the God who's sovereign over us.
these words together. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor the things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of our God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. Love, sir, and go.